Hi, and welcome to the Creating, Living, and Making podcast. I'm your host, Adam. And I'm Grant. And unfortunately, Richard couldn't make it today, but we have a special guest, Morley from Yoram Blog. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. No, good to have you. So as always, we start off our podcast and talk about what's in our clips. Do you want to go first, Grant? Well, this week, uh, I've mainly been doing a lot of editing. Uh, I shot two and a half hours worth of footage on the uh, Mud Kitchen build, which is way too much, like way too much. Anyways, I uh, did a rough edit today, got it down to 12 minutes, approximately four, between 14 and 12 minutes. Uh, and that's the the main thing that I've been working on this week. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I'm going to be releasing this uh, video before the podcast comes out. Uh, how about you, uh, Adam? So I have been working on a um, house extension for a cot. As my wife wanted to buy a cot and it had this like house that went over the top of it, but she wasn't really happy with the design of it. So we just bought a cot and then I made an attachment to go on it. Turned out pretty good. Pretty happy with it. The only thing I had issues with was uh, actual painting. I'm not good at painting, but yeah, turned out good. And for those listening that aren't in Australia, a cot is a crib. Uh, yeah. I was just going to yeah, ask sorry that. About I was a little that, yeah. nervous about asking that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, from I, where I grew up, we always a cot was like a like a bed you would pull out for a guest. Yeah, yeah and it wouldn't be very comfortable. No, <laughs> we just call that a guest bed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Adam. So, why would you be building a crib or cot at this time? Well, and why are we recording this a week earlier than normal? Yeah, so this is actually going to come out next week uh, at our normal time, but. We are recording this a week early because when we normally record this, oh, I actually have a baby due on that day. So didn't hey, really congratulations. get caught up at the hospital when we're due to record. So yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Congrats. Number two, but uh, still quite scary. I bet. Especially during this time. Well, like- my current son's four years old too, so it's not like we're going from like baby to baby. We're going from independent to feed me again. <laughs> So how about you, Morley? What's in your clamps? So I just, I finished up a few projects recently. Um, I was working on um, a pretty detailed belt uh, for my cousin, which I got shipped out a couple days ago. And then I realized that I actually had uh, promised a commission for a friend that I like totally forgot about. Um, his his brother just graduated the police academy and he wanted to get him a gift. Um, so luckily it it kind of came up right when I didn't have something on my workbench. So it was a nice little like two, three day build carved leather keychain for him, uh, which was a nice satisfying thing. And then other than that, like, yeah, Grant, I'm just same as you. I've been doing good bit of editing, um, a lot of planning for projects that I have upcoming, but I can't really start on yet. Um, and yeah, it's good though. Like a video should be coming out in the next couple of days of a garden sign for my mom that my dad commissioned me to make. Um, I'm really hoping that arrives for them tomorrow because it's actually their anniversary tomorrow. So that'd be a nice little bonus, but not putting too much time trust in the postal service these days. So we'll see. Yeah. Fair. Well, I think that, uh, that kind of, you're, you're talking a little bit about stuff that about the, the, you know, creative process, and, uh, and, and I wanted to mention that the way that I actually found you Morley was part of my creative process. Uh, and, uh, what I did is I, I was, uh, building a, a tape dispenser and, uh, part of my creative process is to try and see what else other people are doing with, uh, similar projects and, and see if I can get inspired a bit and, and make sure I'm not copying people. And, and what I found, I went on the on the YouTubes and the Instagrams. And I came across your tape suspensors, the, the plywood, uh, Rockler Bentwood plywood, uh, thing. That's so funny. I, I, I forgot that that was like the first time our social medias crossed and we were basically building opposite tape dispensers. Cause yours was like really like solid and durable. And mine is like a very like delicate (laughs) thing, (laughs) which is actually a really good segue. So as Grant did quickly mention, our subject today is creative process. Also going with 
the actual project itself and then the YouTube videos after that as well. I thought we could touch on that. So um, first up, I wanted to ask when when you're thinking of an idea or a project, where do you start? Um, it's kind of it's a, it's a big question. Um, I, I definitely like follow ideas that seem to have legs to me. And I think the tape dispenser was one of those projects. Like I, I always think of myself as a pretty intuitive person, but that project, I thought of it and was like, oh, this could be really awesome. But I didn't immediately think of a way that I would be able to make it. Um, but I knew that the idea was good enough that I was like, okay, I have to figure out a way to do this. So it was really one of the first times that I kind of like laid down with a sketchbook for a solid hour and a half and was just like, okay, by the time I get up, I will have a solution that works for this because I really love this idea and I want it to work. Um, and I think usually, yeah, usually the creative process for me, it's, it, it starts with that little blip and it's like, oh, that could be a really cool thing. And then usually I immediately run to design or just start like running through iterations in my head. That's how so I running on that work. when you have an idea, what, what, how do you design um, do you use like what programs do you use and, and all that sort of stuff? Like wait, how do you get the finished product before you actually build it? So all it kind of depends the medium I'm working in um, for uh, like wood projects. Um, I have like an engineering background. So I've, I've done a lot of work on CAD um, and I'll, a lot of times take measurements and draw stuff up in CAD and start with like a bounding box and see where all the constraints line, everything else. Um, if I'm doing a project in leather, I like, I've started, this is kind of more recently, but I've started really making like full on paper templates of things where I can, um, I can use the thing as I would, I can use the template as I would the actual leather thing itself. There, I, uh, there's another leather worker here in Toronto that she makes amazing bags and, and much bigger leather projects than I do. And I'm really blown away by her template. So she was kind of an inspiration for that. Um, and yeah, and also just sketching in a notebook. Like I just always have like one of these guys around, um, a lot, but it more so in the notebook is like lists of features and things. The sketches, a lot of it is just in the head is the sketching. So you said you work a lot in CAD. Does that mean you don't like SketchUp? I've heard people that use CAD think SketchUp's not good. Um, yeah, I kind of hate SketchUp. I've, I've used it a good bit. Like when I was like a teenager, I remember like playing around with SketchUp and it was like, I guess it was the first CAD program I was exposed to. And then I used it in university because I kind of had to for a project. Um, but SketchUp's kind of the worst of both worlds, in my opinion. Like AutoCAD's great because, well, AutoCAD's very powerful, but it's still a dumb CAD program in that you're really just drawing lines and it doesn't know what anything is. But I've recently started using Fusion 360 a lot more, which has really like blown my uh, CAD and designing world wide open. It's been really exciting. Yeah. So I went to engineering school as well and took AutoCAD. And I remember thinking like this, this, there's got to be something better than this. And there is. But uh, I obviously, I, I didn't go into engineering. Uh, like I didn't complete that. I, I changed uh gears halfway through but uh you know that's a an interesting thing is is the people who think that there's there's the sketchup crew and there's the fusion 360 crew i think it all comes down to whether or not you care about the parametric design the the being able to change you know if you pick you know all my stock is three quarters of an inch and then you can press a couple buttons and boom everything is now half an inch that to me seems really good, but I, I'm not going to switch because of it yet. Well, I think that's mm-hmm. with me with SketchUp is that I, I, I use SketchUp because everyone used SketchUp and then learned how to use it. Now that I know how to use it uh, quickly and know all the hotkeys and that, I don't want to change because I already it, it, it works for what I need it for. Like I, I Exactly, yeah. And like that's why I really liked AutoCAD for a while is because I was super fast in it and I could take an idea in my brain and get – real world dimensions and see what it would look like really quickly, which is great. Um, and I kind of was learning fusion. I've been learning fusion recently, like not having to actually make a project around it. So I could just kind of purely learn, but the plan being that I'd like to transition to do it as I take on more 3d printing, uh, and digital yeah, well, fabrication. If I a 3D printer or something, I'm definitely gonna have to change programs, aren't I? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think so. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Grant? Do you want to talk about your creative process? Well, I think I think Morley said a a good point that I use a lot is is list. Uh, he talked about having like a little notebook. I have uh, a bunch of ones from Instructables. I can't find one right now. But uh, when you win a contest in Instructables, you you get a a notebook is one of the things you get. And I've started using those and they're, you know, a little small notebook um, and they're fun. But uh, when it comes to actually, and I, I just keep writing lists, I, I write lists everywhere, but when it comes to trying to figure out what I want to do in the future and what actually motivates me uh, to be creative, I look at things like, like the upcoming contests on instructables. Like all of a sudden I'll just be like, Oh, there's something coming up that I want to, you know, have a, a project ready to enter for that. So that like will create something in my brain that says I should do something like that. Um, the other thing is I just, you know, I look at other makers and what they're doing. Like I follow people on Instagram and YouTube and the other social medias um, and just try and get inspiration from that. But I also try and get inspiration from things that aren't maker related because I find if you're only following makers, you end up getting, you know, like pigeon held into like a small thing. So you got to look outside of that. I was recently re- listening to the Because We Make podcast and uh, they had Michael Alm on there. and He's actually like an artist, like, a, you know, an actual trained artist. And uh, and he says he goes to the museums and, you know, that's how he gets inspiration. And I thought that was a really good thing that I might do once museums open back up. Uh, but, you know, a, a good point that Marley Morley said is uh, the list of features. Um, that's exactly what I do when I start a project in my head is I go, what does it need? Like, I want to build a little house for my son to play in, you know, and I've got a little list of features like, you know, I want it to have shutters that can open and close. Like I know in real life on a house, you don't need shutters anymore. But that's one of the things that's just like, oh, I'm just going to write down shutters, right? Like I wanted to have a little windowsill planter because he, you know, that'd be really cute for him to have his own little plants. I love it having those like working features. I think as a kid, I would have loved to have like, it'd be awesome to have like those play things that um, actually work. I saw in, I think it was like the maker subreddit or, or some social media, some guy made like a working fire engine for his kid where the ladder goes up and down and it pumps water and everything else. Like those, those projects you make that actually do like kids want the real thing, right? They don't want the fake thing. And that's awesome. I find that you're it, that for um, your son. Very interesting that you both talk about lists. And as you're both talking, I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever made a list, but then when you actually explained it to send Grant, I didn't realize that it's just a subconscious thing that I do. Like I, I got a build coming up that I need to make um, a workbench at the back of the shop for all my tools. And then thinking about it when I actually thought about making it is, okay, well, it needs this or it needs to have a shelf or the doors need to do this. Like it's a list that I didn't even realize I was making. Yeah, I think a lot of the creative process naturally happens in your head and everyone has different sorts of procedures for Always how they like, get it into the real sleep. world. Like I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean like on that note, I, I get, I go through phases of getting great ideas as I'm falling asleep. And there was like a certain point at school where I'd like, I'd purposely go to bed early just so I could lie in bed for an hour <laughs> and just think of things, <laughs> just try to yeah, think right. of project ideas. My gosh, it's not going to bed earlier. <laughs> and um, yeah, so great. Did we talk about what you use to design? Do you, I think you said you use pen and paper, right? Uh, so I use, I'm trying to get into more CAD like things. Like I, I learned at AutoCAD in university many moons ago, but uh, I've forgotten all of it. And uh, I've used CAD to build the, or uh, sorry, I've used SketchUp to build a couple of my latest projects. But uh, I do find that, you know, it's, it's limited in its abilities and I get that, but it's the free, I have the free SketchUp. So, you know, I, I did design my entire house one day in, well, one day, one week or month or whatever it took to, I, I redesigned my entire house in SketchUp, but then that was three years later and I still haven't done all the stuff that I wanted to do on that. Uh, but uh, I did, that's where I go mostly, uh, or I do a super simple sketch. Like I'm talking 
you know, things that that would make three year olds go, well, I could draw better than that. That's how, how good I do of a sketch. I'm really, I don't know why, but I'm really bad at perspective. I really want to learn, like, I want to do more drawings. I, I used to be better, but now, like, I often have, like, you know, a two corners meet like this. And then the next project, they, you know, everything just lo looks the wrong way. And I just go, why, how did you screw that up so bad that one thing's going one way and one thing's going the other? Like, how could <laughs> you have screwed that up so bad? But uh, it reminds me if you've seen the, it's, um, the, oh, it's a thing on Facebook or something. It's like an artist that took kids' pictures and made them look real. Like, the like, so like they draw an elephant that's like all squarey. So he like actually photoshops a real elephant to look like it and stuff. <laughs> yeah. They were, uh, I think they were talking about that on the Fools with Tools podcast the other day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. Oh, really? So what about you, Adam? Uh, well, I, Similar, I just do a rough sketch and then usually I'll make it in SketchUp depending on what it is. If, it, if it's something simple, I don't really bother with SketchUp unless I'm bored and just want something to do and can't actually get access to the shop. But other than that, yeah, um, I'm actually starting to look a lot more into SketchUp for my video processes, but we'll see how that goes. I have an idea of something, but don't know if it's going to work. I don't want to come across too uh, Chris Salamone. Oh, of like using it for animations and things. Sort of, yeah. SketchUp is great for that. It's a nice way to make some pretty, pretty good looking animations. And like, it is used a lot with the architects for that reason. Um, you can get a lot of nice looking stuff with it. Yeah. My friend actually took like, used SketchUp to redesign. He had a bungalow and turned it into a two story house and used SketchUp and submitted that to the architect. And the architect was like, oh my God, like this is everything down to like the thickness of the drywall, every single two by four that needed to be done. Like they were impressed and his house turned out awesome. I'm pretty, because um, of it. I'm pretty efficient with SketchUp, but damn making a house in SketchUp. I don't know how you said it took you a week. It'd take me months. <laughs> it was only the interior part. So, and I wasn't too concerned about like that's, two by fours and whatnot. That's the worst part. <laughs> I'll be running around the house with a tape measure and my wife will be like, what are you doing? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you when you have an idea for, for something, do you specifically think about, yes, we know you have notebooks, Grant. You've won it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so do you think about your materials or do you just use what you have on hand or? Yeah, so I mean, I work, I work from a very small kind of limited space. So, I mean, a lot of my creative process comes from those constraints that I have. Um, I think like when I was just starting out, I was living in Montreal, like when I was, when I was really making a lot of starting to make a lot of projects and I don't know what it is about Montreal, but people leave a lot of good stuff out on the street. Um, and for a while I was like, I'm not going to buy any materials. I'm just going to make stuff out of what I find on the street, like made like a bookshelf out of like a solid wood, Ikea table and, um, was doing that for a while. And then at a certain point I was like, okay, well I do really want to make this project. So I'm not going to wait until all the perfect materials pop up. <laughs> uh, but well, it was a great, especially when you're living in an apartment or something where you don't have any storage. Like, yeah. It's different if you could go and like salvage and, and like Tim Sway who's got like a warehouse filled with, you know, hollow core doors. Yeah. I, I can't put a stuff away for a rainy day. It's gotta be like used recently or it's gotta be used soon or just like, I can only store so much. Yeah. But, um, wow, that, that'd be pretty, pretty, uh, crazy to think about actually. Like I, I have a pretty small compared to a lot of people, but I have, a, I have a pretty small like collection of scrap wood and all that sort of stuff but to actually have to go salvage every time i make a new project like that's yeah and like that's not what i'm doing now by any means um i mean and that's why i mean leather craft for me is is great right now because i can get a pretty good variety of stuff and it doesn't take up much space and also just like the raw materials for for leather craft are pretty standard i mean you have a few different thicknesses of leather of various sizes um, and as long as I have those sizes I need on stock, I can really make just about anything out of leather. It's maybe a matter of getting different hardware, but that takes up almost no space at all. Um, I mean, really hardware is the, the toughest thing to find with leather craft, especially if someone wants like a really specific aesthetic. Um, yeah. yeah. 
are you able to salvage any leather like hardware or leather like oh yeah for sure you can do yeah, yeah, I've I've cannibalized belts and things. Actually, in one of my videos, I say in it like, uh, my mom had given me a belt for, for my birthday or whatever, and I was like, "Sorry, mom, I'm gonna ruin this belt you made. You gave me to make something else." <laughs> um, yeah, but no, it's I mean, old clothes and stuff is fantastic for that. Um, to get those things because some of that hardware is really hard to find and you don't think about it, but like you may not even know what a specific piece is called. Like, oh, it's like a D ring, but it has these swivel pieces and. I'm just gonna get in a backpack from the thrift store and cut all the stuff I need out of it. So, yeah, that's a good it's idea. It's so interesting. I'm like salvaging, I don't know, old furniture and stuff, and you're looking at old clothes and bags and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, it really difference. changes how you look at how you look at the world. Yeah. Um, what about you, Grant? Like, do you do you think about what you actually the finished project of like what you want it to look like material wise, or use what's on hand? Well, it really depends on the, like, like Morley said, it depends yeah. on the project. Like, it's really hard to not have that be front and center. But uh, I like to use, I like to not use, like, screws as much as possible. Like, that's one of the things I like about designing things is trying to come up with ways that I don't have to use screws or, or nails or any other type of mechanical fastener. But at the same time, I go... It depends on the project. Like this mud kitchen is the first time I've ever used uh, pocket old screws, right? And when you're using them, you, you have to think about it, uh, you know, where, where are you going to hide them and whatnot. But in terms of, you know, the actual material, um, it's hard to say, really. I, I mainly go with what's in my – it's either what's in my garage or walnut. Those That's <laughs> that's the – it's what's in my garage or I have to go to the store and get walnut. Like, <laughs> Is walnut cheap? No, it's very expensive. That's why I don't have any oh, in my garage. Okay. I was going to say because it's very expensive here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cheaper here than it is there. Like it's uh, fifteen dollars a board foot approximately. Um, I wish. And that I pay that. I pay less than that, more than that for pine. Oh, I wow. Yeah. What are these? I'm, I'm curious. Use a lot of reclaimed wood. Yeah, I would. I would think in Australia. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys don't have a lot of the same species we have here, but what are the what are some of like the go to wood species that that you use down there? Pine, pine. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh no pine and merbau. Merbau is pretty popular. Um, that's from like our local hardware store because like we don't have we we have Bunnings, which is like our version of Lowe's, and that's all we have. There's not really hard. There's hardwood dealers and stuff, but they're very expensive. Like. You'll say walnut. I think last time I priced it was like hundred dollars a board foot or something like that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculously oh expensive. Yeah, that that's um, insane. Yeah. But that makes sense. Like where you are to get a piece of walnut from North America all the way to Australia would would be difficult. Oh well, considering it costs Richard seventy bucks a cent a piece of paper, I would hate to think how much a heavy piece of wood would cost. Yeah. To to go along with like what I think about like in terms of material, I also I have so much scrap wood laying around that I try and think, can I use this first? Yeah, I'm the same. I, I agree with that. I, I unless it's something like um shop furniture or something where I really just don't care, then I'll just use like whatever I can. But I usually yeah, I normally look through my scrap and think, all right, well what can I use here to to add to the design or or something and, and that sort of stuff but also going on screws i love screws i'm a i'm a very yeah, lazy, i'm a big screw guy <laughs> i'm a very lazy maker so if i can screw it together and keep moving on it's going to help my process of actually getting it done if i have to leave it to glue up it'll be sitting there for a few days before i finally get off the couch and go do some more work it would make sense if you have like big blocks of time that you have to that you get to work. I have like small blocks, so if I can put something together, it's going to stay clamped up for a week or at least twenty four hours before I get back to it. Yeah. So most of the time, I've got like an hour here and an hour there. So it's not like I have to. I'm always waiting. Like the glue is always fully cured when I go back to it. I never ever have to be that guy who's continuing something because the glue hasn't cured. Well, I think the the only project I've done of just glue, except for I used screws on the stretches, was my workbench, and I it's still that mindset. I still have that mindset of like, 
is glue really that strong? Like, surely I need to put screws in it to hold this together. It's not just glue's not just going to hold it together. And then my workbench shows that that's not true, but you know, still, still think about it all the time. All right, so we'll maybe move on towards the actual filming of um, of our videos. So I was thinking, um, when you when you're going to film a project, do you plan your shots? Like, do you? Or how much do you plan your shots would probably be a better question. I don't really plan them much. I, I think I go into a project with the question of, am I going to make a video out of this project or not? Because it's a lot of work to make a, a full video from a project. And if, I've, if I'm making five belts in a period of two months, I'm not going to make a video out of every single belt. There has to be a story behind it or something, something that's particularly interesting about it. Um. And sometimes it's a gut feeling of like, oh, like I think this is going to be pretty interesting. So let's start filming it and see. And I've done enough leather project at this point where I kind of know the things I need to capture. Um, and I, it's kind of like I, I have I have tried and true angles, tried and true framings and everything else. And then within each video, there's a little bit of variation. It's like, okay, like I usually do this as an overhead shot. Let's try to maybe get this as a macro instead or or plan on speeding this up or film this as a time lapse um but i definitely don't plan every shot um i've gotten a lot better at not capturing everything and making it a nightmare about editing later on because that's kind of that kind of burns you out pretty quickly if you just have to go through like 40 gigabytes of footage on every single video i mean depending on what quality you're filming in um i was gonna say 40 gig i easily go over that (laughs) yeah but i don't yeah if you're filming in four yeah i used to Um, film everything and then mm -hmm. i think it was jimmy deresta was saying like don't film more than three minutes of one doing one thing and i don't even do that now but it really made me think wow i could save so much time on editing and stuff and yeah well it's it's a big difference Mm -hmm. like it's as i've made more videos i feel like i can I, i you see more the finished product in your head as you're making it and maybe that is planning your shots to a certain extent because like, you know how you, you, you have a better sense of how you want the final product to look. And then you're kind of just acting on that in the moment. Yeah. Do you, do you ever actually plan shots? Like think about, like I've got a, um, I've got a project, hopefully my video a week after this comes out. Well, I've already planned how I want the intro to be. So I've planned that shot. Do you ever think about that or? Yeah, I mean, I think to me, intros are a whole nother animal. Like it, it's, it, I put a lot of thought into the intro, and sometimes I'll, I'll I'll hold off on editing a video for like a week because I haven't I haven't fleshed out the intro in my head yet, and because I like I like doing the whole bigger edit of the actual process after I have the intro. It just feels like it's more complete, and I feel like I'm kind of everything is uh, being made for a purpose. I, I, in the past, I used to maybe just like make the whole video and then do the intros and afterthought, but I've kind of gotten away from that. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of planning and thought that I put into the intro as that's like, that's a whole other animal. Yeah. It's sort of that bit of, um, that 30 seconds at the beginning and end that you can actually do some acting and not just film yourself making something actually. Yeah. Especially, I mean, especially on YouTube. Sort of yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you, um, plan any shots, Grant or? Well, I, like if you watch my videos, you know I have to for some of the shots. Whenever I do anything like fun, like shooting off clamps, that's what any, I was just thinking yeah. of. That was the first thing that popped into my head. Yeah, it's it's planning. You have to do it. But uh, otherwise, like there's those small bits that I I think about and I and I think how am I even going to do this? And then the rest of it is basically I shoot, cut something cut it at a different angle, potentially cut it at a third angle. Cause I know my elbow was actually in the frame the whole time, right. For that one angle, which is every time on the drill press. And then I have to go to the other side and I go, why didn't you learn earlier that you should just always shoot from the one side in the drill press. Um, <laughs> but that's pretty much like what I do is I, I, I more have a thought process of when is when I'm doing this, when it, when is the transformation happening? Right. And, and when, like, 
you, you know, sanding. I, my, one of my first videos, I think I had like a 30 minute fucking sanding. I didn't have it in the video, but I filmed for 30 minutes of sanding. And that was, it was as boring sanding as it was watching the video later. And it ended up being like a three second clip, right? <laughs> so I got really good at, the only time that's really bad is like reaction shots. So like if I give my son a toy, it's like a 20 minute video, right? If I give him something, I want all the reactions. I want to see what happens, what how ha- like how he reacts. So it's going to be a twenty minute video or more because I got like the last the one that I'm editing now. We have uh, we have three cameras going to try and get all the the different things. So we got like basically an hour's worth of footage just on him reacting to the the you know giving him the mud kitchen, but otherwise like planning out the shots. I try not to think about it too much because I think I've in my mind, I've already planned them out by planning the project. It all comes together when I'm thinking about making this for a YouTube video. But I also think about it too. When I make something that's not going to be a YouTube video, I plan it out and go, should it be one? Like my always, every project I make, should it be a YouTube video? And I plan it out. How boring would this be? Like <laughs> I made the, uh, there's a alphabet, Like it's a, like every letter of the alphabet into a little puzzle for my son. It's very boring because it's literally scroll saw cut out shape, right? Like, and then you cut out the negative, you cut out the shape, you cut out the negative, you cut out the shape. It's very repetitive. You do it 26 times. I don't, I couldn't see anyone thinking that was a really engaging video, but I could see doing it on like say six shapes but on the alphabet, no, nah, it was way too boring. So, uh, come watch a video where I replaced my blade essentially 26 times. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like, as I hear Grant's answer, and I think more about the question, Adam, like, I actually, I think I, I'm gonna like totally reverse what I said. I think there's an incredible amount of planning that goes into my shots and my filming. I think I'm just, in, when you asked the question, I was thinking like, am I storyboarding out the project before I start? And that's exactly what I'm But I, I don't think you say. need to be, yeah, like I don't think you need to be storyboarding to planning. I think I am like, through every step of the process, thinking about the story, thinking about how is this going to look? How engaging is this going to be? Like how artistic does this look? Or what is this going to evoke? And just because it's not storyboarding, it's still planning. Yeah. And I, and right. So you plan in the moment. When Grant answered, yeah. I also came up with the same sort of thought is maybe less of how much do you uh, plan your shots and more of like how far in it, like do you plan your sh- plan of shots, say Grant, when you do the clamp removal and that sort of stuff, do you think about those shots before you actually start the project or do you start putting the clamps on and go, oh, you know what? I will do this. The first couple times I ever tried it, it was like way in advance. Yeah. I knew I wanted to do it and I looked up how to do it. And then I had to like super plan it in advance. Now it's more of how can I really get it down to being good? Yeah. Right. How can I get it to like being perfect? But if you look it up, it's actually pretty easy. So <laughs> oh, I've done it. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh so I don't play, I don't think about it anymore. Now I think about does that does this video need that effect? Yeah. Right. Right. Because not every video needs some special effect on whatever I'm doing. Right. Like you know you chop the board and it breaks in half. Like instead of using your table saw or something fun like that. Those are all fun effects that you have to plan out ahead. But not every video needs it. So I think about more. You know what needs to happen yeah well like on that too is that you don't want to be doing that every video because it's just the same thing you don't want every video to be the same exactly and i don't know if you've ever like i watched paul jackman and that's how i got my thoughts on how to unclamp things in creative ways (laughs) but uh one of the one of his more recent videos he actually did the like instead of picking up he usually picks up the clamps drops them and all the clamps disappear right and one of the most recent ones he picks them up and goes And then puts it back down and then unscrews them because he he realizes he's gotten like, he's done it too many times. He's memed himself. Exactly. Exactly. And I thought that is genius. He is creative genius. He is. He's very good. I like, I like how David Picciuto 
It's like with David Picciuto with uh, he plays like stand in the place where you work when he's sanding. And <laughs> I feel like every time he does it, he just plays a shorter and shorter part of it just because you know it is, but you don't need to see all the standing. He's like, you've seen me sand before. You don't need to watch me sand for a minute. I, right I hate <laughs> sanding myself, but yeah, watching someone do it. As I lately have just been taking like a three minute clip and just make it speed it up till it's three seconds long. And that's my sanding for a video. In my a couple of my recent videos, I don't even show sanding at all. Like nothing. I don't even put it in there. I go from you know, planer right to it's getting finish on it, and you're like, Oh, did you even sand that? I don't no one's watching my videos as a how to. They're watching mm, them for exactly. inspiration. Same with mine. I hope. Yeah. That's my goal. So that's what I was talking to a guy at my work and he's like, Oh, you know, you should he's watched a couple of videos and he's like, Oh, I, it's a bit hard to follow. Like I didn't really understand how you did this and how you did that. I said, I'm not, I'm not putting the videos out for a how to it's, it's more of an entertainment purpose and hopefully give people ideas. Uh, if you want to know how to sand, go watch someone that teaches you how to sand them, you know? Mm-hmm. So Morley, you do a lot more talking in your videos. Mm-hmm. If anything, you might even say that you do too much. <laughs> your own notes. Uh, but no, yeah. Uh, do you feel like it hampers your creativity or or it helps your creativity to thinking about that you're going to be able to talk over whatever you're doing? I think it helps a lot because I can kind of – I think it helps me tell the story of the project. Um, and it, it, it does make it a little more engaging at certain times. Like sometimes I'll – I'm kind of – was thinking about that recently with a, a video I'm going to make soon and – my initial idea was um, just to do like no voiceover, just like a purely aesthetic showing the process. But then I was like, well, I mean, there is a lot of story in this project and I kind of feel like I would be doing a disservice to it to not kind of explain some of that. Um, I, especially because the things that I make are are mostly like highly personal. So I think that does help the creative process to um, an extent. I, it's never felt like a like a hampering to it. Like I've never felt like I had to do it. Um, it's always was like it's made sense for the video. Yeah, it definitely it feels like an, a, another creative tool I can use. You know, was I used to when I first started making videos, I used to do a lot of voiceover and that, and I've sort of shied away from it now. I more just do like I, instead of standing in front of the camera. This is what I'm going to do, and then do it. Or I'll ex- if it's something like specific, I'll explain it. Like in the crib video, um, I just explained quickly that the reason why I was laying it out was that to make sure it was the right width of the crib and all that sort of stuff. Otherwise, I'll just do it and then be like, "Oh, this is what I did." Mm-hmm. I, I'm like, I really like. I found I like watching people who don't have voiceover. But I also follow a lot of people who have voiceovers, and I didn't realize it until I started thinking about it a lot more. Um, That's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> right, because they're doing it well, right? Mm-hmm. There's some people that I watch, and they're very, like, almost talking too much. And you're like, okay, you can shut up, and, like, you don't need to explain. Oh, and then I sanded, and then I sanded some more, and then I cut this, and then I cross-cut that, and then I ripped this. And it's like, you don't need to explain every bit. I can see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But I've also thought about it a lot. Like, I know um, some people, like, some people have a better understanding of things than other people, right? And I guess I'm trying to make my videos for the people that have a better understanding. Which is exactly what I was about to say. But I also don't, I don't want to lose out. Yeah, like we're Sorry? making our videos more for other makers and not for people that have never done it before. So you watch me cut a piece of wood on the table saw, you know how to do it. I don't need to explain to you, oh, you need to set your this to this height, fenced like this. And like they already know how to do it. Right. And I feel like by explaining it every time, you, you'll get repetitive and feel like – that's where it hampers my creativity. It's explaining the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Like I'm sure I've watched enough of your leather crafting videos to know like what a skiving knife does. If you never explained it again, I wouldn't need, that would be fine. Right. Yeah. Like, and I know I, I guess I've watched enough of them that I, I don't think you explained it as much as you did the first time you ever, you know, bought a new skiving knife. I think is the first time that I. Yeah. 
like heard of it like but you don't explain it every time like this one makes the letter thinner like you don't explain it in every project Mm -hmm. yeah and i think i mean i think as i've done it more it's kind of changed function like like i mean voiceover can work to kind of like tell the viewer what you're doing or to kind of you can you can use it as like a real addition and tell them about something that you can't show them be like, as I was doing this, I thought about this and I, I tried this thing and this is why I wanted to do this, but not that, which I like a lot more. I mean, I, 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 when I watch, like when I watch some of the YouTubers that I feel like are doing at a very high level, like I think Ben Ueda does voiceover very well and that it's, it's, it's integrated into the video and it like, it adds to it versus just describing what's on the screen. And, and I, I hope mine are moving more towards that, but I still feel like I'm pretty early in the process that it's, I'm figuring it out with each video, like where it fits in and everything else it's always hard when you have a brand new tool you want to explain what why you're using it and how you're using it right yeah because it's the first time you've used it and you go you know i'm using a thickness planer it makes wood thinner it's completely opposite of what i just said it did but something whatever. like that though like that what, what do you call what was the tool whatever the tool was doesn't matter is it's it's a special a knife. tool that you would use you know it's you need to explain a table saw it cuts wood you know or a minor saw, it cuts wood, that sort of stuff. The only time I would explain something is um, when I did the the Asian temple, I did a compound minor cut and I just explained that because it's not something you would normally do. Yeah, and I think as as Grant alluded to and I had mentioned to him before, like I sometimes I can tend to over-explain and sometimes I don't catch that until the video is posted and I'm watching it on my phone to kind of get the full effect and I'm like, all right, next <laughs> next video, going to change that. Yeah. And it's it's hard to completely step outside of yourself when you're in the editing, and sometimes you can just get oh, eagle eyes and like, "This is what I'm doing." I've done this that is... so many times. I I um started getting my wife to to watch part of my edits to see what it's like, and the one of my recent videos, I was using the thickness up, and she's like, "You just spent like three minutes of film running boards through a thickness up. Like it's way too long. So I need." And then I just cut mm-hmm. it down, and then. I did some more editing after that, came back to it like the next day to do more editing, did another rewatch and then cut out another half of the thickness there again because it was just too long. It's just, I yeah, I've really got to try and start cutting out a lot more of the same thing. I My videos are, are very repetitive and I've started doing that now actually is I just speed it up. Instead of cutting it out, I'll just speed it up and go really fast. Yeah, but it's yeah. hard. I find the same. I I I under explain everything because I figure everyone understands how it works. So why do I got to explain it? And then my wife, I get her to watch my videos. She goes, I, I don't understand how you got from this part to this part, right? Or why did you even do this? Like one of the videos I showed, I did. Uh, I I made two lines using my pencil, and then I cut in between those two lines on my bandsaw, and I did the two lines because that's the easiest way to find the center is, is drawing two lines equidistant from the edge. Right. Cause trying to find the exact center is very difficult, but drawing two lines are equidistant from the edge and then cutting between those two, you know, that's the center. Um, so I added a little explainer in there, a little voiceover explaining why I did it. Uh, but that's the, I, I tend to under explain everything. Well, I mean, in that, yeah, cool. That also might be a consequence of like your audience. Like you said earlier, like you feel like your videos are, are for makers and people that um, like already have know these processes. But I mean, I think I get a lot of makers watching my videos, but I, I also know that a decent portion of my audience is people who've never done leatherworking and they never plan to. So, or people that aren't even makers and also don't leatherwork. Uh, they just enjoy seeing the process. So like for them, they, they get value out of the voiceover because they kind of like having a little context of what's going on. Um, but I mean, if that's not your audience, then maybe you don't need that little extra addition. It's funny you say that because I actually started watching um, another channel, which I'll talk about later. But um, And same thing, it was stuff that I don't normally do. And the voiceover, I actually enjoyed because it was it was actually explaining stuff i didn't know whereas if it was just explaining how to do stuff that i already do i wouldn't be interested Mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's a big difference between the the like watch me make something cool and the diy or the 
I'm going to explain this to you, or I'm going to teach you how to do something. So it's like, as much as like most of the people that I am hoping that watch this are likely to be makers and already know how to do a lot of things. If I ever get a viral video, uh, it's likely because I made something cool and they just want to see it. Mm-hmm. What's well, even like it doesn't, my video, I don't need to explain it. All my videos lately, I I don't even call them how to or DIY. I, I've removed that title except for the crib because it was actual DIY. Unless I specifically make the video to be a DIY video, and I think that changes your creative thoughts on how to make the video and the process that you go through in making it or making even the project is thinking do I need to make this so that other people could repeat it? Or do I need to make it so that, you know, I just want to show people like the really cool, like I'm sure you guys can see in the background, no one on, no one listening to this can see it, but I got a sled back there. Uh, I made that sled for my son. Like if I were to make a video on that, you know, it would just be like, I made a really cool sled. That's it. Right. Like if you want to see a DIY buy the plans, they're online. Yeah, and I think it's it's good to know going into a project. Like, I mean, I think most of my projects are are relatively things that no one else has much interest in making because they're pretty specific and not necessarily the most pragmatic of things. But some are, and some of them I'm I go in thinking like, okay, this is something that like maybe a lot of people will want to make, so I should go into this uh, production wise thinking like I should show these detailed steps so someone else could make it if they wanted to. That's a, that's a really good point. And even like, even if people aren't going to make the exact same thing that you're making, like your leather uh, notebook, like cover that you showed earlier to all the listeners at home, they can all see it. Uh, anyways, the, that like, even if they're not going to make the, like the hand with the eyeball in it, that's on the front of it, you show enough to go, you know, this is going to, you're going to be able to make a leather notebook cover, put whatever you want on it. I put this for these reasons, right? Like that's you, your story is about, you know, the hand and the eye. It has, it happens to, to go across a a notebook, but that's about it. Yeah. Any other questions, Adam? Yeah. So I think maybe just quickly before we, we finish up because we're coming up on an hour almost, um, just quickly over our, our actual editing process. Now, I saw a story that Grant put on Instagram the other day about two and a half hours of footage. Do you put all your footage into the timeline and then cut it down? or cause- So I, that's something recent I've started doing. Uh, I didn't used to. I used to drag every clip in uh, separately, right, and then edit them and then drag the new next because clip. That's how I do it, yeah. Right. And then I heard uh, Jimmy talking on making it and he talked about, you know, just throwing all the clips into the timeline. Right. And going from there. So I said, wow, I'll give that a shot. Uh, And I've been trying that recently to just it's an interesting way because you see how much you filmed, first of all. So you can then be sad at the fact that you didn't do a very good (laughs) job in your in camera editing. Um, And then it's kind of uh, just a different way of doing it. Um, yeah, it's funny. I had a very similar experience recently. Like same thing. I would put each clip in the timeline and I, I don't, I, I, whenever I, um, make a project, I organize all the files by date. So I'll like, it's kind of a nice little milestone. It's like, Oh, I finished editing for May 3rd and now tomorrow I'm gonna work on May 4th. But what I've started doing is, um, finding all the clips of a process and putting that in. So then I can see how long is this process. So I don't accidentally make something really long and forget that I've only, edited a third of the process is like, Oh, now I have to go back and cut that first part down. It's nice to be able to kind of like see the whole picture and then you can compress everything as once. It, it does make you feel like it can make it feel a little more cohesive. My uh, editing process goes very different to, I think a lot of people because I currently don't actually have a good enough PC to edit on. So I edit on an iPad, but my iPad, I can only hold 64 gig. So it's like, transfer as many clips as was fit will fit then cut it down save the file the um the rendering and then delete all the photos all the videos send on the next lot edit them in 
And then if I want to speed something up, I can only go six times in my editing program. So I'll open up a new project, add the file, in, the video in, speed it up six, like times six, render that video, then put that new one back into the new project, speed that up another time six, render that video again, and then put it into the original project. It's, uh, yeah, Adam, you don't have to be ashamed of your jankiness. My, I can only go up to four times on my editing software. So I, if I want to go more than that, compress it, render, put it back in to 16. And then like, if I want to go more than 16, then it's going to be another render. Yep, same. I think me and uh, Morley use the same. It's, uh, do you use Movie Studio? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's solid. And it's a solid program for sure, but it does have that like limiting factor of four times speed up. And you're just like... I just like five would be nice, you know, even like, <laughs> would, like sometimes it's like not like you don't want to go that much further, but you're just like, oh, if I could just get this, like it's a, oh, you know, a 10 second clip. If I could make it six, it'd be good. Yeah. I even sometimes use it to my advantage. Like I'll load in a lot of clips that I know are going to be sped up. So I'll speed them up, render them, then I can delete them so that I can then transport more uh, transfer more clips over to then edit them in yeah it's uh it's not it's not the best but it works for now hopefully if um if i can make up my mind i'll actually end up buying a computer in the next couple of months i just have to talk myself out of getting a motorcycle <laughs> but even today when i was editing like my i have a really old lap well not really old i have a really shitty laptop well I bought it for my wife. So it's a really nice <laughs> laptop that I bought for my wife that doesn't have a lot of computing power. Um, but like I bought it for her to do like schoolwork on. And now my actual computer was running Windows XP. And I said, well, that's not, that's outdated now. You know, Windows XP came out in like 2000. So it probably, it probably needed an upgrade. But uh, like I get, like I can't, a lot of if I shoot anything in 4K or at uh, like 240 FPS, if I want to do like some slow motion stuff, I can't watch it. All I do is I put it in the thing, I render the video, like I stretch it out so that's full, uh, like slow mo, render the video, and then that's the only way I can watch it. So if I want to zoom in, I have to like go back in, do that again. So you actually record in slow mo. I record in higher FPS. Yeah. So that so, I can slow it down. Right. I, I, I don't really use slow-mo that much. I, I feel like my clips are already slow enough. But um, <laughs> I. So what about when – do you do time lapses and stuff or do you just fast-forward the footage? So that's, that's something – yeah, good filming. Like in your filming process, do you think about that? That is something that I actually do is I, I'll try and – when I know it's something that's going to take a long time and if you – the people watching this or listening to this or don't go watch the mud kitchen build. There's two spots where I actually just went straight up 30 times time lapse on my camera camera while I was recording. And it makes life so much nicer, but it doesn't like I have a GoPro. It doesn't record sound. So that's the only yeah. part that kind of sucks. I don't think any, um, any time lapses record sound, but I, I don't know. I, I've always been worried about a time lapse of actually missing something, which doesn't make sense because I then speed it up like 30 times. But, <laughs> yeah. How about you, Morley? Yeah, I do. I, I do a lot of time lapses when I do leather carving. Um, it's because uh, it can be like a, a small leather carving could take like 15 minutes or so. Um, and sometimes I do want to get those nice macro, like the slow curve of the knife or something, but sometimes I, I just want to show the whole process and time-lapse works really nice for that. Luckily, there's also no sound that needs to be captured, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. And I'll just set my camera to, to go like one frame a second and then set it to either like 30 or 60 FPS. Yeah, but no, it's great. I, it's a, it's a great tool and I'm, I like, I'd like to also use it on larger scale things. I'm sure the file would be a lot smaller than a 10 minute video that I would have to transfer over as well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so it's been about an hour. We want to wrap it up. Maybe we'll um, move on to our recommendations for the week. I don't know if um, Greg told you to get a recommendation, Wally, but yeah. He did. All right. The cl clamp foundation. 
clamp menus. Yeah. We use Should the I... word clamp for everything. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Molly? Sure, yeah. So it's I mean, Grant Grant told me it didn't have to be a maker video of any sort, but I feel like I my mind at first goes to that and I mean, to be honest, I haven't been watching very many maker videos recently. Um, but something, since I know a lot of people are locked down, I do have a show recommendation. It's not a new one, but I think it's a great show for walking, watching when you're um, when you're stuck inside. And that's The OA. It's on Netflix. I think it's a Netflix original series. Um, it's a fantastic, I don't even know what the genre what you would call it, mystery, sci-fi, suspense, drama sort of thing. It's really beautifully shot. It's kind of the perfect thing to watch, like nice headphones on in the pitch dark, lying in bed. It, it has some really beautiful cinematography. Um, I don't really want to explain it at all because I think it's one of it's a it's a wonderful show to go in blind. But if it's it's kind of supernatural, it has um, I think it has really good depictions of like life in twenty nineteen current year whatever as um as a kid in a way that like a lot of shows really don't it's it seems pretty relevant to that sort um there's two seasons the second one i say it was a bit wilder than the first although the first one is pretty wild it just <laughs> does take a bit of a turn but it's awesome me and my girlfriend both like it i'm always surprised that more people haven't seen this show so since i got this the platform of you guys i'm taking this opportunity to suggest to people watch the oa because it's an awesome underappreciated show never even heard yeah, of it that- um it's not yeah. my recommendation. It's really good. But I will ask, have you both seen the TV show called Upload? It's no. Very, very interesting. It's only got one season out now. It's on Amazon Prime, I think. Um, but it's about life after death, I suppose, in like the year 2035. But you actually you actually upload into um, an online community instead of actually instead of, Yeah, sort cool. of. Yeah, it's it's really good. Yeah, it's on my list of uh, shows to watch. But I've seen OA. OA, like sometimes I'll catch myself doing the little moves. Yeah. And yeah, uh, and, yeah my wife gets it right away, which is good. Because otherwise you just look like a, like out of right. place. I'm going to watch OA. Uh, all right. Well, for for my clamp mandation this week, uh, or what's what I recommend putting in your clamps, I recommend you guys watch uh, Full Metal Al. It's the uh, latest video by uh, Al's Hack Shack. I saw his Instagram post. It looks so cool. Yeah, it was really like I didn't have enough time to watch it, but I decided I was going to take the time anyways, and it was worth it. It's two years in the making. I watched the trailer not like, I don't know, six months ago when I finally uh, found Al's Hack Shack, um, and I was immediately gone like, oh, why? why where's the next part of this? Um, and luckily it's now been released. Uh, it's awesome. Um, I think Al is probably one of the most underrated, uh, YouTubers out there, but I kind of get it. Cause he's like, not the most, uh, scheduled releaser of content to put things nicely. You know, he, he puts it out sporadically and that's great because I, I just love his stuff. Uh, he's super creative and I just, you can see in that video and why it links back to the, the creative processes. I think you can see from the trailer he did two years ago to today, you know, how it, how it all came. And if you listen to the fools with tools podcast, you can hear a lot more about it, but, uh, yeah, that's what I recommend you guys put in your clamps this week. Yeah. I'll have to watch that. Like I, 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 I love Fools with Tools podcast and like it's one that up to like a month or two ago, I would listen to sporadically. And every time I listened, I was like, wow, this is really good. I should really listen to this podcast more consistently. And it's it's like quickly become one of my favorite weekly podcasts. And I, I don't think I've seen one of his full videos yet, but yeah, I've heard it hyped up and this seems like a great one to kind of get into his channel. Um, I've never listened to Fools with Tools, but... Maybe I should because you both keep raving on about him. <laughs> I've heard <laughs> of it. I just I've never never actually listened. Um, and ours was it ours Hack Shack. I, I've never yeah. heard of, but definitely check that video out. Um, so my recommendation for this episode is some 
also someone I believe is underrated on YouTube, um, and that's the Smuggler's Room. I found him the other day. He um, came up on my newsfeed on YouTube, and it was a uh, workbench build, but he absolutely loves Star Wars. So every one of his builds is Star Wars. Um, and it's Yeah, I follow him on Instagram, yeah, but I haven't seen his videos. His, um, so his workbench build like was really good, and his editing is really good. Uh, well, his like video style is is really good. I really enjoyed it, and started watching back all his old videos and and all that. And he's only got twenty thousand subscribers, and I feel like he should be way over that hundred thousand, one mil, easy. Um, yeah. So yeah, and he's been mentioned on uh, making it podcast before as well. He's been the recommendation, I think, from uh, Bob, if I recall correctly. That would uh, make sense so- because he loves Star Wars too. <laughs> yeah. Does he does he work as a prop builder or something? Because he built some pretty No, big that's his his full time No, that's his full time job is YouTube now. And every build okay. is like so he has an eight part series of converting his basement into and the inside of a Star Wars spaceship battle or whatever they are. Wow. Um Yeah, so <laughs> pretty pretty uh pretty impressive and and as we were saying before about using things we wouldn't think of is he uses he he will pull every single thing apart and use parts from it to make other like he'll i don't know pull a speaker apart and he'll use parts of the actual speaker to then make it look different when he actually glues it onto the front of something and uh greeblies or something i think he calls it i don't know if that's what they're actually called but he's sort of like adam savage <laughs> when it yeah well, Adam Savage did work on Star Wars, so yeah. I'm sure they have a lot in common. <laughs> but I, was, I was just watching these videos and I'm like, wow, I really want to, if I could be bothered it wasn't so lazy, I would love to like redo my workshop and make everything look like it's a mechanical piece. It's, he's very talented. That's awesome. Um, anyone have anything they want to say before we go? No. No, right. no other business from me. Okay. Okay. Um, well, where can we, um, where can the listeners find you, Molly? You can find me on all the socials, mostly Instagram and YouTube at Yelrom Blog. It's my first name backwards because Morley isn't unique enough as the name, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> y e l r o m Blog. Yeah, and I make uh, videos pretty pretty regularly. More so, more regularly as time goes on. <laughs> And if you go to your blog, you can actually find things from 2017. Yeah, it goes pretty far back, back when it was mostly a blog. Yeah, it's a nice time capsule because it hasn't been updated since then. Uh, I know. I got to make a new (laughs) post soon. I'm itching too. Uh, But, uh, you know, I'm going to like embarrass myself here, but uh, it took me like three months to figure out that Yelrom was your name backwards. So it seems to be with most people. It doesn't reveal itself, (laughs) which is crazy. But uh, I was just like, that's a really weird name. Like, I don't know. (laughs) And you said your name's Morley. And I'm like, that's really weird. Morley Yelrom. That's really weird. (laughs) It seems like everyone has this certain moment of clarity where they're like, oh, (laughs) I get it. Usually when they get my sticker and then it kind of all comes together. I think that might have been when it it happened. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Anyways, you guys can find me at uh, the Grant Alexander on all the socials and uh, mainly the Instagram and YouTube type. Seems like we all actually only use Instagram and yeah, YouTube mostly. Uh, you can find me at Maker Mackie on all the socials again, mainly Instagram and, and YouTube. Awesome guys! Well, thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank yeah, you for, thanks for coming. On. It, was a, it was a good episode. Thank you everyone for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. If you did share it and maybe leave us a rating down below, there'll be show notes down below also where you can find everyone with all our recommendations as well and keep clamping. Bye. Bye.